Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, secure coding techniques. I'm Sashi. I'll be moderating this webinar uh, uh, this evening. Uh, for those of you who are joining our webinars for the first time, uh, a quick introduction about Staroff. Uh, at Staroff, we are trying to create a vibrant community of Java developers where uh, you, know, you could find interesting career opportunities, the opportunity to network with uh, you know, uh, Java specialists and like-minded folk, and also the opportunity to kind of seek help with problems if you seem stuck at work. Uh, and, and you know, uh, the main purpose of a webinar you know, is to kind of bring uh, you know, top flight tech speakers you know, from uh, you know, different parts of the tech world to kind of touch upon um, you know, areas that are of uh, you know, great importance to developers. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, you know, it could be like a new front end framework. It could be a different way to uh, write your back end uh, APIs. It could be a you know, different programming paradigm, like the React to programming or things like that. And sometimes it's uh, something that's much more deeply uh, uh, important and much something that that is you know broadly more important for everybody, uh, uh, like you know the cybersecurity and you know things like that. So so today's uh, you know webinar uh, is on uh, cybersecurity, which uh, you know we all understand is uh, a very important uh, issue today. Uh, you know previously you know uh, programmers are not expected to write secure code as much as they are expected to now. Uh, so, uh, so we wanted to bring you know somebody really special to kind of do this webinar. Uh, so, so we have a great speaker. So we have Jim Manico joining us today from, uh, I believe, the US, uh, or you know, looking at the background, maybe someplace else. So, <laughs> thanks, Jim, for joining us today. How are you doing today? You're doing great, uh, Jim. You know, a quick uh, you know introduction about you. Uh, you know, to the group that has joined us today, and then you know I'll. Get out of the way. Yeah. My name, so, is, uh, my name is Jim Manico. I'm a security researcher and I'm a professor. I teach secure coding classes at my firm, Manicode. Right. Okay, That's great. It. So, no, I, I've got something more formal here. So, I'll just go do that. All right, go that. ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, Jim uh, you know, trains uh, software developers in secure coding and security engineering. Um, you know, he's been an expert who's been involved in this area for a lot of time now. Uh, you know, Jim is also the founder of Breakman Security Inc. and uh, an investor and advisor for Signal Sciences. Uh, you know, he is the author of Ironclad uh, Java, you know, uh, building secure web applications, McGraw-Hill. And, uh, you know, Jim, if I'm not wrong, I've seen an O'Reilly book too. So I think this is the same book. Uh, and the O'Reilly books are quite popular with the programmers, you know, we call them the animal books. So, uh, so interesting to see that there. Uh, Jim is also uh, a volunteer for and a former board member of the uh, OWASP Foundation, uh, and his Twitter handle uh, Manicode, uh, you know M A M A N I C O D E, a play on his name, uh, is quite popular with developers around the world. Uh, so that's about Jim, um, and you know a quick introduction about the topic. You know, uh, cybersecurity obviously is top of the mind for everybody right now. Um, you know, um, today's topic will you know focus on. Uh, you know, uh, helping you take your first steps in the direction. So we will briefly talk about the top 10, uh, you know, uh, this is basically a session on, um, you know, uh, standard awareness uh, for, you know, web, web application security professionals. And uh, the session also presents some of the most critical security risks to web applications and, uh, you know, what developers can do to kind of uh, ensure that, uh, you know, uh, ensure any uh, you know security related pitfalls in their code and write more tightly and more tight and secure code in their applications and uh, you know we will also kind of uh, you know uh, see how to write defensive programming you know code that is much more robust and holds up to any cyber attacks or things like that uh, so so with that you know uh, i would kind of get out of the way and then have well, well, uh, the one more thing hey sashi one more thing before you go yeah. sashi do you know who krishnamacharya is by any chance um, you heard this name? It's very famous. Yeah. Krishnamacharya is one of the is the modern modern father of yoga, right? And under right. under, under Krishnamacharya, there are two famous teachers: Patabi Joyce in the school of Ashtanga, and mm -hmm. Iyengar the school of Iyengar. BKS I practice BKS Iyengar. I pra a very famous book light on yoga. I practice yoga for about an hour and a half every day, and I switch back and forth between. Uh, Iyengar and Ashtanga, very different practices. So I'm a I'm a student of Krishmacharya. I practice yoga on a on a very on a daily basis, and I think of India and the wisdom from India every day of my life. So I'm very happy to be here as well. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's amazing to hear, Jim. That's amazing to hear. Yeah. At the, end of the talk, of... at the end of the talk, I'll show you, I'll show you some, I'll, I'll do some, I'll do some poses. I'll show off some handstands when, when we're done. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. So, I'm, so yeah, I'm ready. all yours, all yours. Yeah. Take I'm ready. Time. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Jim. I'm going to be here. And Sasha, thank you so much for arranging this and setting this up for, for everyone. So let's get to work. I want to talk to you about the OWASP top 10 today. And so what is the OWASP top 10? This is an industry standard that defines the top 10 web security risks. And this is published every three or four years. There are four main project members. One of them is a data scientist who focus on publishing this on a regular basis. And here's the main URL. By the way, I, I'm gonna give you a copy of this presentation at the end of the talk. So you'll see I have a lot of other links in my talk. I'll be sure to give you a copy of this at the end so you can get to all those resources. And so please keep in mind, I, I want you to understand two things. We have the OWASP top 10 here. We also have the application security verification standard. The application security verification standard has about 300 requirements and the OWASP top 10 has 10. So please understand that what I'm about to talk to you about is entry level, bare minimum. It's a great way to get started on secure coding. But what I recommend that you do though is I recommend you read the application security verification standard. This is a much more complete view of application security. It's much bigger, many more requirements, but this is what I want you to read after we're done today. That should be the next thing you read after you read the OWASP top 10. So this is the OWASP top 10, access control, broken crypto, injection, insecure design, security misconfiguration, out of date third party libraries, problems with authentication, failures in data integrity, lack of security logging, and a very specific vulnerability, server side request forgery. We're gonna go over all 10 of these risk categories and give you lots of references to read more about them later, right? So we, we, th this is the change. I'm not gonna go over this. It's, there's, there's three new categories, insecure design, software and data integrity issues and service side requests. Those are new categories this year. So let's start with access control. Now, broken access control is the number one risk. But why is that? We as programmers have known about building access control into our software for over 50 years. This is a very old defense, one of the foundations of all of secure software. So why is this number one? Now, please understand that access control is really difficult to test from an automated tool. When I build this, like one of the main ways we test our applications for security is to run a scanner that scans our application or our code and looks for vulnerabilities. But the problem is our scanning tools are not aware of what your access control policy is. That's the difficulty here. If I go look at several different applications, everyone does access control a little bit different. So how do I know if that feature is for an admin or not? I don't know that and neither does the scanner. And so a lot of the scanning tools that we rely on, they're not gonna do a good job at finding access control problems. And access control can be very difficult for developers to build our frameworks don't really give us mature access control functionality when we have difficult requirements to solve. So one of the problems is indirect object reference right here. How, how would I attack this URL? If you were a hacker and you saw this URL, which reads private messages, and there's the message number, how, would I steal messages from another user? That's my question. How do you steal messages from another user? And it's very simple, right? All I would have, 
all I would have to do is change that number in the URL. And that will change the number in the database query. And now easily by changing the number in the URL, I can steal other people's data or I can steal other messages. This is one of the most common problems when it comes to API security. Try it in your own software. Look at any number that's being fed into your application, whether that number is in the request or in the URL. And if you can change that number and you can steal data from another user, then you have an access control problem. And this is one of the most common problems when it comes to access control flaws in software. One of the ways I fix it is, is I'm gonna add some, I'm gonna add access control at the database layer itself, right? So at the database layer itself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add some stuff here. I'm gonna say, well, if that's, if that's the message, that's a good start. That's one for that. And if the owner or the recipient is two, which is the user ID from session, right? Right there, user ID from session. And what this is, is this says that unless the, unless the message owner or the message recipient is the current user logged in, that I'm not gonna show that message. This is one way I can add security to this particular feature. And there's no standard way to do it. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Also, I like to make sure I don't hard code roles. Like normally we would hard code roles in a lot of software, but I'd rather code to the feature name. This is gonna make my software much more flexible in how I design my access control. It'll, it'll make my software more flexible in terms of adding new features. So I recommend your enforcement point in code should be the name of the feature, not the role of the user. I still use roles. I just don't think you should hard code them in your software. And here's some other ideas with access control, right? We want to enforce access control by the activity or feature name. We want to do data specific access control. We want a central access control mechanism. We want all requests go through an access control layer. We want to make sure if anything goes wrong, we deny access by default and fail in a secure way. Use the right data to drive access control problems and make sure you can change a user's configuration in real time and it takes effect right away. When you're building a data model for access control, build proper grouping and build your admin screens first to manage all of your access control data. A last note here is that it's really hard to add good access control late in the life cycle. So this is one area I try to design well up front. So we're looking at the, uh, here's some resources to read more about access control design. This is the authorization cheat sheet. This is written by um, a young woman in Bangalore, Bangalore, right? Um, and uh, fan fantastic researcher. This is NIST 800-162. This is the, the North America standard for access control design. I know you're not in North America, but it's still a very good document to read if you're building your own access control system. And these are the application security verification standard requirements on access control. You'll see those, you'll see I have them listed in my presentation in these earlier slides. There's all the ASVS rules. Very, so there you go. There's our first topic of the day, access control. Let's move on. A2 is cryptographic failure. We're looking at the OWASP top 10. We're now looking at the second item here, cryptographic failure. Okay, so first of all, this topic number two used to be called sensitive data exposure. That's the symptom, but the cause, what caused this problem is some kind of broken cryptography. One of the first things we want to do is use TLS 
everywhere. This is HTTPS. We do not want any HTTP communication anywhere. You really should not be using HTTP anywhere. We want to use HTTPS everywhere for everything. And don't tolerate plain text. And there's way, we want to make sure that this is well configured with things like strict transport security and preloading. In general, you have to configure your TLS to do well. And it, and it takes a little bit of work, but it's very easy to set this up correctly. Also, a big part of cryptography is managing your keys properly from key generation, key establishment, key storage, key usage, and key change are the major steps. So we have to rotate our keys on a regular basis. The other thing is when we have cryptographic keys, we want to store them in a secrets management vault. So the key is not even extractable. I keep the key in my vault. I send data into the vault. I run the algorithm I want to run with the key and out comes the signature. But the key is locked in the secrets management vault. This is one of the hearts of how to do key management. The other thing you want to do is I love I, I love having a key family. I'll put one key in my hardware. I'll put I'll have one key per service and another key when I'm encrypting data. So this is called a key family. And this URL at Cash App explains how to design that. Also, when you take a look at Azure, they have Azure as a cloud has really good key storage capabilities to help you do powerful cryptography. The other thing I recommend, and this is something that Cash App uses as well, by the way, this is something that Cash App considers, is to use Google Tink. Google Tink is a library for Java, Android, C++, Objective-C, Go, and Python. Let's see what else they support. I'm going to go look at Tink. I'm going to see what's new at Tink here. So let's go check this out. Here's Tink. It was updated seven days ago. We like that. Let's go look at their homepage and let's see what languages they support now. And see, they support encrypting or storing keys in Amazon, KWS, Google Cloud, Android, and the iOS keychain. Really good support for keys. I'm looking at Google Tink. So who's using Google Tink? Uh, like Slack, Adidas, Airbnb. So I wanna see what languages they support. That's why I'm here. What is Tink? It is, this, this, it's a cryptographic library. How Tink works. I wanna see what languages you support. Where are you? I want to encrypt data, sign in, overview. Are you gonna tell me what languages you support? Maybe not. Someone needs to help them with their documentation. Cause I wanna see if they support new languages. So I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna Google. What, what languages does Google Tink support? The reason I'm doing this is because Google Tink is by far the best library for applied crypto. So I'm gonna do a little, I'm doing a little research with you. So let's see what you support. They support envelope, look at Python, C++, Let's go check this out. What do you got? Oh, there it is. Tink supports encryption for Python, Java, C++, Go. Now they support they support other languages. It's okay. That's okay. This is very, I'm, I'm gonna stop now. So Java, Android, C++, Objective-C, Go, and Python. Yep, yeah, straight up. This is again, some of the best crypto libraries I've seen in our entire industry. And I highly recommend you use it. If you're using a language not on this list, I'd recommend Libsodium. Libsodium is another excellent cryptographic library that makes doing crypto easier to do wrong. Here's some resources I'd like you to read about crypto. Here's the transport layer cheat sheet about HTTPS. These are tools you can use to verify if your TLS has been done correctly. And this is the cryptographic storage cheat sheet. This is a good start to reading about applied cryptography.
let's keep going. We're looking at A3 in the OWASP top 10 now, right? Look at A3 right there. This is injection, the third risk that we see within uh, secure software and insecure software. So let's talk about injection. SQL injection is very popular. We see it in most applications. And SQL injection happens when an application inserts untrusted data into a database query by constructing a string based query. So basically, when you're building a query like this, this is wrong. This is not how we want to build a query. So what's what's wrong with this is the big question. What is wrong with this? What's wrong with this is they're using string concatenation to add this variable directly into the query. And I can literally change the query by sending data into this, into this function. And this will lead to the query being changed. Like, look at this. So let, 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 let's actually look at this for a second, right? I'm gonna go to Sublime Text for a second. Uh, oh, ignore that, trust me, ignore that. Let's go to File, New, and close that out. So here's, what, here's the thing I'm trying to say. If I have like a SQL statement, right? If I have a SQL statement, and it's gonna be, you know, select ID from users where the name equals data plus the single quote here. So if I, if I say like my data equals Jim, and then the query that would run would just be this, right? It would select, it would be select, I select ID from users where the name is Jim. That's what we expect. That's a great query. No problem. But my attack could be something like this, Jim or one is one. And then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll do this, where one equals one. There's my, there's my attack right there. Now, what would happen if I use that for my name? Then the query that would run would be this, select ID from users where the name is Jim or one is one or true. Exactly, Sujay. That would mean the entire user table would return. Because if you say or true, you remove other where clauses are just removed or true. It's always true. And I just got the entire table. So that's SQL injection. How do we, and by the way, can we use input validation to fix this problem? No, we can't because even valid data can cause injection. This email address is a legal valid email address, but it's also SQL injection. So how do you stop SQL injection? Always parameterize your queries. That's the answer. We wanna really parameterize your queries always. Remember, we looked at this in Java, very insecure. How would I fix that? I would do this instead. I'd use the prepared statement class I would have variables right here that these are the binding variables and that salary will go into variable one and that ID will go into variable two. And now we're safe from SQL injection and our queries will run a lot faster. So that's and that's the main category here. So here's some resources. Here's Bobby tables that will talk about SQL injection. Here's the query parameterization cheat sheet. And that will give you some information on how to stop injection. Let's keep going here. So the fourth category on the OWASP top 10, we're looking at insecure design right now, right? Let me clear, let me clean that up. We're looking at insecure design as our next topic. Now, what do I mean by secure design? When it comes to secure design, this is a new category that talks about threat modeling. What we're suggesting is, is that many of the security issues that we see in software is more complicated than what a scanner, a security scanner can find. Like you might be using the wrong crypto or you might be storing keys incorrectly or using the wrong algorithm. It's really difficult for a scanner to find design flaws. So in those cases, what we want to do is do threat modeling. I want to give you some presentations to watch. Like Avi Dugan works for me. He's one of my teachers. 
he, there's a great presentation on threat modeling. I'm also a fan of Tony in Atlanta, Georgia. These are two of my threat modeling favorite experts out there. We're now looking at five, right? We're looking at category five, which is security misconfiguration right there now. So why is configuration so important when it comes to application security? Because so much of the cloud and software in general, and software in general is done through a configuration layer. Like if, if I'm trying to stop problems with an XML parser, I have to configure that XML parser correctly. And so this topic can span anything from password length to file permissions to access control and much, much more. You need to read the manual and understand hardening guidelines for your different frameworks to, get, to configure them correctly. Here's a framework for Python. Here's a hardening guide for WordPress. Here's a hardening guide security for struts, for ASP, for Spring. Every major framework has some kind of security hardening guide available to help you do better security in that framework. This is a good place to start. Also, we wanna use some configuration helper tools. Like this is the Mozilla SSL configuration generator. You specify what server, what level, what library, and it will build the configuration file for you that does a good job at setting up your server. So there's help here. By using this configurator, when I run the SSL lab scanner, my server at Manicode is an A plus because I used configuration helpers to set up my server, right? Do it right. Let's jump ahead here. If you can't verify your configuration, then it's best to assume it's not secure. You want to read the manual, understand security configuration needs. This is all especially important in the cloud, right? When you're building cloud services, how you configure your YAML files and your cloud configuration is going to matter a great deal. We're looking at this. We're looking at six now, A6, vulnerable and outdated components. Hey, has anybody heard for log, anybody heard of log4j? Has, have all of you updated your libraries recently? I hope you did, right? Because in the world of Java, we found out a few months ago that Log4j, a very popular logging library, was heavily vulnerable to remote code execution. Nobody expected a logging library to have such a severe security problem. So what do you have to do? You want to keep your libraries up to date. I recommend that you use this free tool called the OWASP Dependency Checker. This is a free scanner that will run inside of your development environment and let you know if you're using any libraries that have security bugs in them. There's also, if you're using Git, GitHub, I recommend Dependabot. This will issue a PR when your libraries are out of date and encourage you to fix them. So everybody, do me a favor, keep your third party libraries up to date. Most developers do not do this. And this leads to major security problems on a very regular basis. So almost every application has a problem with third party libraries because most teams do not keep their libraries up to date. So please take a look at the dependency check product. It's free. Please run it every single day and keep your libraries up to date. That's very, that's, in, my, in my mind, this is the number one issue facing web security. This is even more important than access control. Number one, Based on Log4j, keeping your libraries up to date is probably the most important thing you can do for security. All right, A7, identification and authentication failures. So this is all, the, like, first of all, what is authentication? We're trying to verify that an entity is who it claims to be, identifying who a user is. 
And an authenticated session is either a session ID or a JSON web token that tracks the authenticated state of a user. The problem with authentication is that there are so many topics when it comes to authentication. It's hard, it's very difficult to keep up with all of this. One of the things I recommend you read is Daniel Meisler's Consumer Authentication Strength Maturity Model. This will show you all the different forms of authentication here and which is gonna be stronger. I recommend you never use passwords by themselves. Passwords are terrible security. So I think at the very least, you should be doing this, right? I think at the very least, you should be here using multi-factor with SMS or app-based multi-factor or a multi-factor token or go use like a YubiKey or a smart card, some kind of cryptography. So this is what I like here. All of that multi-factor or stronger should be the minimum for authentication. Also, if you're going to build your own, if you're going to build your own authentication system from scratch, I recommend you read this standard, NIST 863. They define new rules on what your password should be. And here, here are the new rules for passwords. The big change is they want you to block common passwords and block any breached passwords, right? There's, we can get databases of common passwords and we can look up a list of passwords that have already been hacked. Another thing is we want to understand how to store a password. And I recommend you use Argon2ID. This is the best algorithm for password storage. And here's a cheat sheet that talks about the different algorithms that you can use to store passwords. I'd give this a good read as well. I know I'm only giving like a brief talk, but there's a lot of homework. When you get this talk, there's a lot of links I want you to read because learning about application security is challenging. And as an engineer, I recommend you read a little bit about security every single day as you, as you learn. All right, so here's some resources. These are the application security verification standards on, on um, authentication and session management. There's a lot of requirements here. Also, this is a, our North America standard, NIST. 863 even though you're not in north america this is a great standard for how to build a strong authentication system it's a great read if you're an engineer or an architect we have three more eight nine and ten the next one is data integrity failure this is a new category this year to making sh it's all about software updates for the most part right and the reason this is important to me is because, um, first of all, we have deserialization problems in Java. And here is, and, and the secure coding guide at Oracle does a really good job in how to talk about this problem. So I like this. This is a really, really well done guide. Deserialization of untrusted data is inherently dangerous. And let me show you what I'm reading right now. I'm reading the, the secure coding no. No, oh, no, no. Where is it? Let me get rid of the get rid of that little anchor. There we go. This is January of 2002 updated. This is so so well written. Historically, yeah, don't J and I don't use J and D. Anyways, historically, this is the ninth version of this of this standard. They did a really good job. Everybody should read this. The very the early versions of this from Oracle were terrible and from Sun were terrible. They've really gone out of their way to make that guide better. Another thing is consider the rule of two. And I'm, I'm gonna get this, this is a Santa Claus. We don't need, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna say, um, check your scripts, not once, but twice. There we go. There we go, much better slide. So check your scripts, not once, but twice. 
whenever you're going to download and run a script, I recommend you do two checks before you run it. Because when we're doing DevOps and building a DevOps pipeline, something very common is you want to check the hash of that script to make sure the attacker didn't change it. I don't think that's enough. Whenever a vendor makes me download and run their script on my server, I'm gonna verify once via the download hash and verify a second time from GitHub. Very often, if a vendor makes me run a script, they publish it in GitHub and I can go to GitHub and review it to make sure it hasn't changed before I run it. So again, if you're gonna run a script that do you're downloading from a vendor, do two separate checks to make sure a hacker has not changed that script. A9, we're almost done here, right? A9, security logging and monitoring, right? The, the goal, so first of all, this is an, uh, th this is a uh, uh, category we've had since 2017, security logging and monitoring. It's part of the community survey that brings this in. Um, it's added from the top 10 community survey. This is great. So the survey said we should do logging. I agree. The goal of security logging is to alert on specific security events. When someone's hacking me, I want to know about it right away. The other problem is you might be doing good security logs in your software, but you need to understand if your network team is actually looking at those logs. So what I recommend you do, you and your security team, come up with a standard around what security events that you should be logging that way your your operation team will understand what is and what is not normal so they can tell when you're being hacked i'm going to recommend the cheat sheet this is the uh, application vocabulary cheat sheet it will show you a list of about 40 different 40 different events that you should log in a security log so your infrastructure team knows when you're getting hacked and so there's two cheat sheets here, the application logging, that's what you should log, and the logging cheat sheet, what you should not log, like around privacy. So again, work with your security teams, work with your operation team, so you understand what security events you should be logging. This, my friends, is our last category. I'm, I'm going to go before, hang on for a second. Before we do our last category, I want to give you a copy of this presentation. So if you go take a look in Dropbox, look in chat right now, you'll see a Dropbox link that I just send you. There it is right there. And that will give you a copy of this presentation, right? You can just download it right there. And there's a PDF. These are all the slides I used today. So you have a copy of this presentation yourself. You'll see that in the Zoom chat right now. Okay, here's our last category of the day, server-side request forgery. Server-side request forgery also came in through the community survey, right? This is people voted to put this category in. And even though it shows a low incident rate, a lot of our scanners and testers don't know how to find this until recently. We became aware of server side request forgery across the world in August of 2019 when Capital One was hacked. Other researchers were talking about this in 2016, very briefly though, and this is where we got global awareness. Now what happened was we see at Capital One that this variable was a URL. So this is like CapitalOne.com and they had a parameter that was a URL that the server acted upon. The server would take the URL parameter, read that URL, embed it on the page, and then send that data back to the client. An attacker changed that URL 
to be an Amazon Web Service URL to the credential file of their web firewall. So this is kind of ironic. The attacker broke through the firewall to steal the firewall credentials. The attacker then used those credentials to log into AWS and steal 100 million records from Capital One, one of the biggest uh, loss of data from the finance industry. Also, GitLab was vulnerable to servers on request forgery, and they announced it and what went wrong. Also, Microsoft Exchange, this is 2021, right? Microsoft Exchange was vulnerable to servers and request forgery, led to many attacks across the entire world. And so how do I stop server side request forgery? I want to make sure if I'm building a URL that the server acts on, that I build it safely. Also, if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to take a parameter that the server acts on, then I got to validate very carefully that that URL is legal for your server. A little bit of validation to make sure that URL was a capital one URL would have stopped this problem, but they let any URL be triggered by the server. And that was a big mistake. To stop this problem, you want great authentication or access control, even on your internal APIs. Having an internal API with no security is a really bad idea. And if you're going to use a URL as a parameter that the server acts on, then do very strong URL validation. Make sure it's a legal URL on your server. And how about don't take a URL as a parameter? Just don't do that at all. It's a bad feature. Also, if you're going to build a URL, URL encode the parameters, and you can even set up network rules to limit what your services can do. Micro segmentation on the network. So here's my conclusion. We're almost done. Number one, you want to develop secure code. Please go read the application security verification standard and look at the OWASH cheat sheet series. This is a big collection of secure coding knowledge. Also, test for security continuously every day. You got the scanner zap, you got the third party library dependency checker, and here's our guide to help you learn how to test your applications for security as a penetration tester. You know what? I am done for today. It's been my great pleasure. If you have questions for me, please let me know at jim at manicode.com. And I also, with this URL that I sent you, um, I, here, here's a copy of the presentation that you're allowed to download and use. Does anybody have any questions before I go back to bed? <laughs> I hope this talk was of value to you. You have my uh, email. So, yeah, uh, so I've got assumptions that got to me. Uh, so, uh, I'll just provide that too uh, for you to answer. So one question is most developers these uh, kind of uh, you know, use uh, frameworks like Spring Boot, Laravel, Node.js, and stuff like that. Uh, and that kind of, you know, implicitly they assume that gives them the license to kind of not worry about security because, you know, they, uh, they sort of say, book may have already thought about it. Like, I think, you know, SQL injection, I think you raised some very interesting points, you know, especially the, the you know, uh, SSRF uh, and then, you know, the, the security risks with uh, third party libraries and all. Just wanted to, you know, um, you know, uh, the question is, you know, fairly straightforward. So, so what advice do you want to give people who are using frameworks? When you're using a framework, you need to have ex expertise in that framework. If you don't have expertise in a framework on your team, then you shouldn't use it. And so I would go find a security guide for your framework, right? I would take a course on your framework maybe, but here is, yeah, this is the Spring Security Guide at Spring.io. 
So I go look that up, right? Is all, is all, I'm, I go look up, um, yes, um, securing spring at spring IO, right? Is there, where is that article? Yeah, securing a web application at spring. You're getting started. I would read this. I'd study. I want, you, there's so many things to learn about, about building a, a secure spring application. Look, and there's all these different guides on how to do it. There's spring boot, there's spring, there's spring security. That's Aegis old school. And just in general, I like to get a, I like to get a, what I like to find is a spring hardening guide for Java. Mm-hmm. See if I can find, and, and, and th- that's the, you know, uh, the guide here, yeah, just that's spring security. Yeah, authentication and access control. And they'll give you a, a lot of advice on how to do this. So you got to study somewhere within your within your development group, somebody needs to have extreme expertise in how to use Spring. And Spring is super complicated. It takes years to learn Spring. So you can even bring in a consultant to help you at Spring for a little while or dedicate somebody on your team to understanding how to lock down the framework. But you want to, and these guides are out there, right? So there's there's one of them right here we're looking at, right? I'm not sure where, it's somewhere on Spring IO. Securing a web application in Spring. And they're gonna give you a lot of advice on how to do that. So you gotta read, study, and practice. It's not easy. A lot of people just grab Spring and start using it. I go through a security guide first before I do so. Right, right. Thanks for that. So, and then the other question is, you know, more general. So, uh, you know, in your experience, what has been the most common security uh you know um issue that most programmers you know pro- security uh you know uh sin that most programmers commit third party libraries being out of date is the biggest problem developers don't want to update their libraries because if you do it's going to break your break your application and you have to go and do regression testing and see why you broke it and fix it so the biggest problem by a wide margin is all of the insecure libraries that all of us have in production right now. We need to update those libraries on a regular basis, and it is very painful and expensive to do so, but we have to. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. I think, you know, uh, it's a wonderful survey. You know, when, when, when the session was announced, you know, when we so, you know, when we told people that we would be talking about the top 10 security issues, then it seemed like very simple. So it's going to be a list of 10 things. You check them off the list. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty comprehensive. You know, uh, each is a different area in itself. And like you said, each requires, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, learning, you know, and time and all that. Yeah. I think Sonar is crap, by the way. I don't use Sonar, Sujay. A lot of people use it because the whole infrastructure for Sonar is good but their actual scanner is total crap. So mm-hmm. I would, I, I, it's free, you can get started. I would use, I would stop using sem, um, um, Sonar and I would use SemGrep. This is totally free. This is a, one of the best tools out there today, SemGrep free download. It is a code scanning engine built for Java first that will scan your code for free and tell you where your security bugs are way better than Sonar. Sonar's code scanner for Java security is crap. It's good for linting, it's good. It's, it's a good build server, but they're just, they, they weren't a security company. They're a dev infrastructure company and they added, they added some scanning rules later. And it makes me upset because a lot of people use them. They think they're doing security. I'm gonna say it again, Sujay, Sonar's code scanner is very poor quality. And if you want something free, I'd move to SemGrep. And they, they support a lot of languages, including Java and many others, and many, many others. And it's used by all these big companies. And it is free. Free. Love right. free. All right. 
and uh, yeah, I think you know it's time for uh, those yoga poses. You know, if you want. All to right, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do one yoga pose, then I'll get out of here. So what am I doing? So I want to go to my. I'm gonna go. I gotta go to settings real quick. Where's my settings? Uh, yeah, I'll do. I'll do. I'll do one yoga pose. Meeting info. I had to turn off the background in my camera. I don't know right. how to do that. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go to video. And go choose my background and go to none. So you can see my now we're in my kitchen. All right, what am I gonna do today? This, this, is, what, this is what I've been working on in my practice, right? I do a lot of I do a lot of hands. <laughs> yeah, I like I like to just like hang out and handstand a lot. And then from handstand, I'll do like forward things and stuff. Whoa! You know, just flexible. Kiss your feet every day. Mwah! That's it. I'll stop. Yoga is not meant to be showed off. It's meant to be. <laughs> Look, no, it's uh, really not. Yoga is to achieve union with the divine. It's for me to challenge myself. I shouldn't be showing off. But it's like it's a good practice. It goes back like from Patanjali Sutras, like thousands of years. We start talking about yoga. And it's it's something that has come out of India and the whole world loves it. Everywhere I go across the world, Everyone does yoga. I can always drop into a yoga studio, do some practice with my friends around the world and connect to the universal divine anytime I want to. So I love India. Thank you, everyone. Okay. That's amazing. That's amazing. And 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 I think you know, just want to add one thing, you know, cybersecurity is easier in comparison to, you know, kissing your own feet. So, you know, on that note, uh, you know, I thank you, uh, Jim, for taking the time out to do this session. Really interesting session. We all loved it. And would like to have you do it again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Namaste. Yeah. I'll see you Bye. next time, everybody. Thank you so Namaste. much. Namaste. Yeah. Bye.